welcoming everyone to tonight's training. It's a Citizens Climate University, which is a weekly webinar program of Citizens Climate Lobby that provides CCL supporters like you and I with access to in-depth training opportunities on topics relating to climate change and effective climate advocacy. I'm your host, Brett Cease, and tonight's topic is specifically zeroing in on how to host a CCL house party. And joining us, we have three CCL leaders, Bill Barron, Sarah Karish, and Julia Selker for a training that's gonna walk you through how local groups have hosted house parties, open homes, or climate action salons in their own homes to generate engagement in their local communities for CCL and the Energy Innovation Act. So with that, let me just do a quick introduction so that we can find out a little bit more behind all three of our speakers, and then I'll pass it to them so that we can start learning their stories. So first up, we're gonna have the wonderful Sarah Karish, who is a CCL group leader in Fairfax County, Virginia. Sarah has been volunteering with CCL since 2016 and is a wonderful group leader and a source of uh, all sorts of information outside of even house parties. So if you have any questions throughout the rest of tonight on grassroots outreach as well, she and her team have been spearheading some of the most successful clipboarding activities that CCL has seen across the country. And uh, joining us as well from the Mountain West is Bill Barron, CCL's regional coordinator for all seven of those states out there. Bill is committed to the idea that building relationships is the key to our success as climate advocates. And he's focused on supporting volunteers throughout that whole Mountain West area, encouraging creativity and engagement and building CCL community. And a fun fact about Bill, Bill founded CCL's 12th chapter, Salt Lake City, back in 2010. So he's been in that role of regional coordinator since 2013 and has seen a lot of growth since then, needless to say. And then uh, our third presenter tonight is Julia Selker, who is an Oregonian living and working in Washington, D.C. in the sustainable energy industry. Uh, Julia joined CCL after interning with her congressman, actually, and assessing carbon pricing bills, and uh, says enthusiastically that HR 763 was a clear winner, and she rides her bike everywhere. And we are so grateful to have you joining us as well tonight, Julia. So with that introduction, uh, we are just going to give a quick review for our agenda. We're going to quickly talk about why house parties and give a little bit of a background behind some of their early stories of successful house parties. We'll have a chance then to jump right into the Fairfax, Virginia example for their community climate party. We'll take questions then about uh, Sarah's efforts and her groups. Then we'll fly over to Utah and focus on the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Action Party that Salt Lake City has been hosting throughout their city. Take some more questions. And then we'll zoom back over to DC to focus on their creative climate action open house. Uh, each of these CCL leaders are going to focus on the resources that they also have provided for support. So with that, um, I'll just give a quick shout out as well. Another origin story here that we weren't able to have live join us, but uh, was really an inspiration for a lot of the other house parties early on, uh, is featured here. And I'll put a link uh, in the chat window to the vlog article actually. Uh, that focused on New York City's Climate Salon Party. CCL New York volunteer Sydney Rubin wanted to inspire business leaders she knew to support climate solutions. And so what she did essentially was work together to organize a climate salon event. Uh, you can see here business leaders in her home connecting, learning, and getting inspired. Sydney is also a business climate leaders ambassador. Business climate leaders is a wonderful action team within Citizens Climate Lobby that really helps American business leaders shape federal climate policy. And so just a shout out as well to one of these early house parties that brought 50 guests, including eight CEOs and eight C-suite executives uh, with companies that were representing about 638,000 uh, employees, I believe. And so I know that this angle isn't going to be included in the other three that we're going to learn about in just a little bit as much. And wanted to also highlight that if you're interested in finding out more about how to really host a house party with that business angle and uh, to feel free to reach out to us and we connect you with uh, business climate leaders as well after tonight. With that, I will pass it to uh, Sarah and we'll get up and started here with our three live CCL leaders tonight uh, by focusing on Fairfax's story first. Thanks, Brett. Um, so we held our community climate party 
uh, at my home uh, back in September. Um, and um, basically this was a climate oriented outdoor party um, and uh, we invited my entire neighborhood. Um, the idea first came uh, basically from wanting uh, kind of an innovative way to sort of spread the news about the Energy Innovation Act. Um, I was feeling a little frustrated by kind of lack of national media coverage. We don't have a super robust local media market. I thought, you know, how can we just get people to know about it, even if they're not, you know, going to be um, become climate advocates or become CCL volunteers. I just thought people need to know. Um, and I am lucky that I live in a neighborhood that has a um, pretty kind of, you know, active social life um, and community spirit. People host um, driveway happy hours or open homes parties, things like that. So I figured if we uh, set something up uh, and, and told everybody about it uh, and told them that there were, you know, was free food and drinks, they might show up. Um, and so I, I brought this, uh, this idea to our chapter meeting in July and people were excited about it. And uh, fortunately, two wonderful volunteers, Rose Hendricks and Meredith Haynes agreed to help me with a lot of the planning. We could focus the party on the idea of the carbon dividend. Um, and the reason for that was, um, you know, the dividend is just so unique in our policy. And, um, I thought it would be a way to kind of have some fun uh, with, with it and, um, you know, focus on something that's, you know, maybe not strictly, um, you know, totally centered on reducing emissions, um, kind of the kind of climate policy talk that maybe I enjoy at parties, but other people might not. Um, so, you know, the idea of free money, maybe that could get um, people who are not sort of the usual suspects um, excited. Uh, so what we did was everybody who came to the party got a little carbon dividend and uh, they could then spend this dividend at the, um, at the food and drink table. Uh, and uh, we also gave people the opportunity to earn extra dividends by participating in some of our activities, you know, writing a letter to Congress or um, playing our climate quiz game, something like that. Um, and what we said to people, what we explained um, was that, okay, in real life, um, if this bill is passed, you won't have an opportunity to earn extra dividends, but you do have uh, the opportunity to make your dividend go further, right? But if, if you reduce your carbon footprint, if you take those steps, then you can stretch that dividend. So that was the, the analogy we made. Um, and we thought, okay, for the dividends, we could use monopoly money, we could print cards that said one carbon dividend, but I happen to have a wonderful willing artist in my family, my 10 year old daughter. So um, she made these very uh, lovely, unique cards. So uh, the different activities we had, um, we uh, had sort of our standard tabling stuff. We had information about the bill. We had our constituent comment forms. Uh, we had our climate quiz wheel, which uh, we bring to a lot of tabling events. Um, Meredith Haynes uh, uh, designed this beautiful carbon footprint activity, which she um, adapted from something that another local climate group does with congregations. Basically, this was three giant footprints on my garage door and um, they all represented a different area like food or transportation. And then people could um, write down on sticky notes, um, you know, what actions they were taking or planning to take to reduce their carbon footprint in that area. And that actually was a huge success and generated a lot of conversation. Uh, we also adapted various lawn games uh, to the climate theme. So um, in this photo, you see my daughter and her friend playing croquet. Um, in our version, the, um, the ball represented um, the the bill and each of the wickets was one of the uh, the obstacles or hoops that the bill needs to go through on its way to final passage. So they were all labeled like you know introduced in the House, introduced in the Senate, you know, uh, in committee, whatever, until finally uh, signed into law by the president. 
the uh, the party also represented kind of an uh, opportunity to um, kind of uh, you know do some coalition building. Um, we thought about inviting a lot of other climate groups. Um, we kind of opted to be a little conservative there, uh, just because we really wanted to make sure we were keeping it very focused. Um, but we did invite our friends from Mothers Out Front. Um, they have this um, wonderful campaign for electric school buses in, in our area. And they have this uh, cardboard uh, school bus that everyone loves to take selfies with. And um, we just thought that really fit in well with the sort of family friendly vibe we were going for. So that was a lot of fun. Um, we also thought, well, should we invite influencers or um, people who have endorsed the Energy Innovation Act? And um, here we also wanted to be cautious because um, it was campaign season in Virginia and most of our endorsers are uh, elected officials. Um, so in the end, we only invited one and that was um, my local school board member because you know, she really is you know, my local school board member and connected to the community. And, and that, that worked out nicely too. Um, another kind of synergy we had going was we were um, able to get some of our beer from uh, breweries that had signed the Brewers Climate Declaration in support of HR 763. And so we had a nice um, kind of sign explaining what that declaration was about and, and listing um, all of the breweries. So that was fun too. So in terms of logistics, um, you know, we asked uh, chapter members to contribute food and drink, to uh, volunteer um, at all the different stations. And it actually was a wonderful kind of gateway um, volunteer event for a lot of uh, members who hadn't gotten super uh, involved up to that point. Um, and so, so that was really nice. Of course, it was an outdoor event. We had to think about the weather. We had my house as a, as a backup, but luckily we didn't have to go inside. Um, we tried our best not to overlap with um, other kinds of events going on in the neighborhood, um, although that's always difficult to find a Saturday when nothing is going on uh, in nice weather. Um, and we tried to you know, be mindful about our, uh, uh, the environmental impact of, um, of you know, our event and, and uh, having a lot of disposables and stuff like that. So one thing we did was we asked everybody who brought food just to bring finger food. So that way you could avoid any plastic utensils. Um, you know, we did have some disposable um, plates and, and cups, but we also asked people to bring their own cup or glass and a lot of people did. Um, so, um, so yeah, all in all, it was a lot of fun and um, I, I was pretty gratified um, by, um, you know, having a lot of my neighbors show up that I sort of ordinarily don't get to have these kinds of conversations with. And I think um, it was a lot of fun for, for all the volunteers too. And we have some resources here um, that I guess are going to be available uh, in uh, the speaker notes for this slide. Um, you know, there's the party flyer that we drew up and, and posted on the bulletin board in our neighborhood park um, and uh, sort of messages that I posted on our neighborhood listserv. Um, but the real um, key thing is there's a link to Rose Hendricks' blog. Um, she wrote up um, a, a very detailed post about the party, so there's a lot more information there. Thank you again so much, Sarah, for leading us off here with such an inspirational version of the Community Climate Party uh, that Fairfax put together. And I will pass the baton to you, Bill, to highlight, uh, again, another wonderful story in Utah. Thank you so much. And Sarah, thanks for your share. That was really great to hear what you did, because I think there's a lot of opportunity to, to be creative in so many different ways. Uh, for our work in Salt Lake City, it was sort of the theme was, who says climate action can't be fun? So we, uh, I reached out to a friend of mine who's very supportive of the work that we do for CCL, but isn't directly involved. He's really busy with his family. And just threw out the idea of, would they be willing to host a uh, energy innovation and carbon dividend action party? to their friends as an opportunity to get uh, other folks who are not familiar with the Energy Innovation Act uh, to become familiar with it and, and to learn more about it. 
So the first step that we did was to, uh, you know, how could we uh, reach these folks? And the idea was really to try to create a theme of let's have some fun talking about a bill. I mean, who really thinks about talking about legislation is, is a fun thing to do necessarily. But we also know that this, is, uh, this bill is really the key for us is to try to get the word out in the community uh, and to try to get more people familiar with it. So we created a really brief uh, email that um, we sent out to, uh, well, not myself, but my friend sent out to a network of friends that he had where it was really highlighting that this was an opportunity to learn about a federal bipartisan carbon pricing bill uh, that would, and I wanted to be sure that people knew how uh, powerful this bill is. So highlighting that it would reduce America's emissions 90% uh, by 2050. So they really knew that this was a, a powerful bill, but that was really uh, sandwiched between trying to have a, a fun time talking about it. And so we really stressed that it would be a kid friendly event and that they're uh, to bring their families uh, the way this uh, event was set up was we um, had a couple parents who, who watched the kids play outdoors while the, the event was going on. And so uh, as far as the, the invitation that went out, we, uh, we sent that out really with trying to keep it brief and, uh, you know, the who, what, when, where, and why. Um, and, and then really tried to encourage that uh, it would be really helpful if um, we were able to get RSVPs so that we could coordinate, uh, you know, what, what sort of numbers that we would be facing uh, that night of the event. So this, this idea was used in, in three different applications. Uh, one was with a friend of mine who reached out to his community of friends. And then the, uh, so we did it three different times. The second time we did it with uh, the local Patagonia outlet, who's very supportive of uh, community efforts, where we did the same sort of theme where we had a, uh, a, a, a energy innovation and carbon dividend action get together. It wasn't really called a party. And then lastly, we had another a uh, person who had been uh, distantly involved with CCL, but very supportive and put out the invite again as a way to try to get people who are outside of sort of the CCL network to reach out to their communities of people to get more engagement and uh, more people familiar with CCL on a basic level as well and more specifically learn about the fact that there is a bill that's been introduced, the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. So we, we did it in three different applications um, and it was, it was very uh, effective in, in doing that. So um, if you, let's see. So the, the key is to, to, you know, we thought was to make it fun so um, we created these action stations. Uh, you know, one of the things that you find in these presentations is it sort of, you know, people sit in their chairs and they get stuck in the chair and it's kind of, you know, it gets kind of boring, I think. Um, and we really wanted to try to avoid that. So we created these action stations. We had four action stations as a way to, um, you know, have people move from one place to the other. And so we started out with an introduction about CCL briefly, uh, in, uh, just described the bill that we're working on, and then uh, talked about each station. We had four stations. We had a little sign that numbered the four stations. The first station, um, and these vary depending on each of the events, but uh, station one for us was online actions. So we really wanted to try to get people taking action that night. And so we had a handful of uh, computers where people could go online and use the online calling tool on uh, the website where they would write their member of Congress. We also pointed them to uh, the social media 
uh, pages on CCL with the, the simple thing that, you know, if they're not uh, super social media oriented, they could certainly at least uh, repost the things that are posted by CCL, if nothing else, as a way to get the word out. So sharing those posts from uh, Citizens Climate Lobby. Talked about the uh, hashtags as an opportunity to, you know, share uh, and comment and really try to build momentum with the hashtags that we're all familiar with. Um, depending on the venue and in one, one of these events, we had uh, station two is the beer refill. Um, that, that doesn't always fit with every event, but um, in this case, it was a, kind of a, a nice ear uh, uh, icebreaker to have for people to just mingle and have conversation. The third station we had was uh, to sign up where <clears throat> we invited people to think about, um, you know, where, if they would be interested in hosting their own uh, energy innovation and carbon dividend action party, or if they would like to donate to CCL, uh, that would be uh, an opportunity to also just contribute financially if they are not able to have uh, the time to get involved and volunteer with us. And then the fourth station uh, we called Speak Up. And this was uh, where we invited people to practice a uh, elevator talk around the bill with the idea that, you know, ideally we'd love to get new people familiar with the bill enough so that if they were in a, uh, an environment where they <clears throat> were meeting with people that they could actually talk about the bill to some degree uh, and, and sort of help other people familiar, familiarize themselves with the bill. So it was sort of a, a way to try to invite people to mingle and to have a good time really and, and try to think about how, you know, being active and, and, and doing, raising awareness about the bill can, can be a, a, a social and fun event as well. So then we would uh, really talked about uh, following up with the attendees um, and really uh, one of the things that we did with those stations is to have uh, volunteers who weren't necessarily, you know, longtime volunteers with CCL helping out with those stations. So it gave an opportunity for people to have fun and to get familiar with, you know, talking about the bill or, or explaining how to access the online, uh, you know, uh, writing Congress uh, program, as well as uh, really trying to give people the opportunity to you know, practice their own laser talk as they help other people learn about it. So we really uh, wanted to reach back to the volunteers who helped support that and see how that went for them. Uh, we also wanted to follow up on um, you know, what, what interests uh, we found with the volunteers that attend or the people that attended that were uh, coming to the event. And then uh, again, um, you know, another thing that we thought about was how we could uh, look at how um, maybe people who are attending the event might know people who are leaders in the community or run businesses, and would they be able to help us connect them as a way to try to also get endorsements at the grass tops level? So we were kind of just, you know, uh, spreading a lot of uh, different ideas out there and giving people different tastes of different ways to be in action. And uh, we found that this was a, a, a really fun event and um, people seemed to have a great time and, and learn, learn about the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act at the same time. And uh, Brett will also include in the, in the notes that we had a uh, you know, there is a, uh, an invite that we sent out that you could use as a template, as well as a document that spelled out the, uh, the actions that we did. And like I said, you know, the, the beer re refill in station two might not be the right fit in some cases, but you know, it's just trying to have fun and mix it in with a, a way to raise more awareness about this important bill and the work that we do.
thank you so much, Bill, for the genesis of other stories and uh, the learning of what we'll find out here in this next uh, story even, but uh, just a wonderful walkthrough of what's worked so well for Salt Lake City for us all to benefit from in our own local communities. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'll try not to repeat too much of what you've already heard, but there will be some similar ideas. We are trying to get people who, um, who were curious about the movement, who were looking for a, a way to get involved um, to, to consider CCL and, and learn a little bit. And then we also wanted to um, kind of build community, especially within our chapter. Um, and that's the meet cool people part. So this was our, our poster. Um, it, the idea started as a social event for our chapter members to get to know each other. I had only been involved with CCL for a few months um, and just done a couple canvassing events. So that's um, how it started. But then Debbie found Bill's video on the CCL website. Um, and that's what, what got us interested in the open house festival style stations uh, format, which we ended up using. Um, so similar to Bill's party, we did um, we did like six or seven stations. We also had a drink station with climate cocktails. Um, we had uh, uh, sex on the beach that is now in Missouri. If you know the cocktail name, um, you'll get the reference. Anyways. Um, yeah, uh, we had practice and elevator speech, uh, like Bill had. We had um, we had the climate science station where we had some of the main reports uh, that people could look through, like the national climate assessment, um, and then uh, a few others that you'll hear about through the through the talk. Yeah, so I think the most important thing for us that kind of set the stage for the event was deciding on the location, um, which I think kind of informs who you'll get attending. Um, so, and, and then what you're able to do there. So at first we were thinking libraries and, and those are going to be a little, um, a little limited in terms of drinks and food. Uh, so eventually, um, we were allowed to do it at this artist space near my house where I had been to a climate event before. Um, and they have a following of a couple thousand people in the area. Um, and they're, from what I saw at that previous event, they're, the people who follow the, the space were worried about climate change. They wanted to know more, but they didn't know very much and they didn't know uh, how to get involved. So it was kind of a perfect um, opportunity to use this space where we could have drinks and it was free. Um, and then also tap into this other community of young artists and try and get them involved in the movement. Um, and then we also uh, invited kind of anyone who wanted to come. Um, but yeah, there, there were trade-offs. It was not very uh, physically accessible. It was hard to find. <laughs> we had to post uh, some, some posters at the corners of the blocks. And, um, and then there was a really steep staircase to get in. So um, next time we're planning to do it somewhere accessible. Um, but hopefully we'll still uh, be able to have a potluck. Um, we had people bring food and then we told them to bring their own forks and knives and cups. Um, and then I just brought all of the Tupperware that I've accumulated over the past year. You know, and that was nice because we had people thinking about being low waste, um, even as we were focusing on structural change. So we uh, brainstormed the stations ahead of time and basically sent out the volunteer sign-up form after we'd gotten sign-off from the event space that we could do it. Um, we got like five volunteers just from sending it out to the chapter listserv. And then Debbie passed it around at the chapter meeting. We got probably another five. And then I reached out to a few friends who are not in the chapter, but one is a social media expert. Um, and then two were able to, one did the drinks. And then one was at the welcome station, um, which was actually really uh, key. We got a lot of feedback that having the welcome station was really nice. So uh, if you're thinking about doing a similar event, um, it's also a great way for people who are new to the organization to, um, to volunteer, but you know, people who are very gregarious, uh, but maybe don't, don't have the pitch down yet. Um, it, I think it was, they had a lot of fun at the welcome station and everyone who came was like, I'm so glad that someone told me, you know, where to go and what to do. Um, yeah, so let's see. We did have two to three people per station, Bill, and it was great. One person had to cancel, they got sick, so there was redundancy. And then also I think 
for the number of people we got, which ended up being kind of like 30 or 40 at a time, but kind of 55 throughout the course of the evening. Um, there weren't a lot of people, you know, even though we had redundancy at the stations, there weren't a lot of people just sitting around. <laughs> so um, that, that, was, uh, that was a good call. And then it was not stressful for anyone because they had backup. And so, uh, you know, if someone was nervous about volunteering for something, uh, they had nothing to worry about because they knew that they would have friends there. Oh, we also did um, uh, an art station. So we had a little art project where you would write a hope for climate change. But I think again, for that station, you don't need to be an expert to just introduce someone to the concept and hand them a marker. So uh, yeah, you have a mix of stuff that works for experts and, um, and, and new people. So we just promoted on Facebook Eventbrite, listservs. Um, I don't know that I did next door, but basically any, so um, it worked. Uh, we also, uh, I, I mean, the, I think if you're worried about getting enough people, the individual invitations really matter. So if you can tell everyone at your chapter meeting or give them an email um, format or even a text format or something to send out to five or ten friends, um, if you get a personal invitation and then that person has someone they can ask questions to if they're like not sure if they want to go, that's really helpful. Um, and that works for volunteers too. If you need more volunteers, have, sending out a personal invitation, no, nobody turned me down for a personal invitation to volunteer. I mean, I, selection bias, but um, that was cool. And then we had a keynote speaker from our Children's Trust. We also thought about inviting other um, climate groups to be involved and we think we'll do that next time. Um, but uh, for this one, uh, it was kind of serendipitous. People have been telling me to get a, um, a keynote speaker and I wasn't sure if that made sense with the kind of uh, station format. But then when I saw our Children's Trust present, um, they're leading the Juliana versus United States uh, lawsuit, which is arguing that a stable climate is a constitutional right. And they just had a ton of great information. Um, it's, it was so interesting. Um, and then they also brought with them some actions. So they had two social media campaigns going on, I think. So they would take pictures of people at the open house with their sign. Um, and then you could also do some other tweets. Um, so that was great. And every, every action that someone could take at the open house, I feel like that left them feeling like they were already part of the movement because they'd done something. Um, so that was great. So um, I, it definitely worked for getting chapter members kind of to become experts, even if they didn't feel like they were experts, I think. They, um, they yeah, I, I saw people um, really come out of their shells, like answer all these complicated questions that I didn't know they knew the answers to. And I don't know if even they knew that, you know, they had this level of expertise, but I think it kind of shows you as a volunteer that just by being involved with CCL for a while, you become, you know, knowledgeable and, and, uh, and you have this to share. And then newer members were able to deepen their expertise seeing other people where they were at. Um, we were, I think, very lucky with the turnout because we had 100 plus RSVPs on Facebook and we were not going to be able to accommodate that many people. Um, and then we capped the, the Eventbrite RSVPs. So um, that was 150 potentially people. Um, but just the right number of people showed up. Uh, so that was just lucky. Um, we had a little bit, I, I know that one person came to a chapter meeting after the open house, but I'm not sure that we really activated people to join us. Um, I think they were, they left knowing more about the movement, knowing more about climate change, knowing more about carbon pricing, especially because we did focus on that. Everyone liked the speakers. We had a journalist come and make a video about um, the event. So that'll be in the, the extra, uh, information <laughs> page. Um, yeah, and another thing that was helpful beyond, um, beyond uh, redundancy in volunteers was having a few uh, people just floating around. So like I wore a silly hat, um, as you can see in the picture, it was a cupcake. Um, so if people had questions or, you know, wanted to know where the bathroom was, they could just say, go to the lady in the cupcake. And then Debbie was also uh, you know, floating around. Um, oh, we also went live on Facebook, which was great because we had, you know, it had a lot of energy because there were people, um, you know, talking all around. And then we'd go up to each person, each station and have the person explain, you know, what they were talking about and, 
and and how the event was going so that was really fun and then we have this extra video um which is great and then after the event um we did two hours of open house and then we did two hours of just unstructured social time so we had a little dance party at the end we you know we got to hang out for a while and um so we got the chapter bonding in as well and then also brought newbies more into the fold the helpful resources and you can see the picture of the uh, share hope for climate action which we put up on a big big board but gonna steal some of sarah's ideas for art projects for the next time and we have some big plans because it went so well um we are talking to a congressperson about hosting a similar event on the hill with more climate organizations and the theme is going to be meet the movement so we'll have people come from you know so everyone is invited to you know kind of do the open house thing and then we'll also have potentially congress people meeting the movement which would be amazing so that's not guaranteed yet, but uh, we have interest at, from the congressperson, which is already pretty impressive. And if, it, if it's not there, uh, we'll, we'll do it in other places because it was really fun. And the other thing about an open house is that everyone can kind of lift according to their uh, abilities and enthusiasm and no one has to do that much in, in the way that we set it up. Um, a little bit of laissez-faire leadership, but also, um, you know, you just had people sign up you had enough redundancy that if they didn't come through it was going to be okay and and then we had a great time so bravo thank you thank you thank you julia this was exactly why we're here tonight to learn from those that have gone before and put together such a creative result so uh but with that how you can find out more if you do have anything uh, that we didn't speak to tonight that you'd like to personally follow up or ask bill sarah or julia their uh, contact information is listed here and as always, we love having more discussion in CCL Communities Forums. So feel free to jump right in there. There's a lot of active uh, discussion going on with this and others, and we'd love to learn from your ideas too. So for tonight, we just wanna close by saying thank all three of our esteemed guests and CCL leaders for helping really enlighten and empower us to try this out in our own home communities. And we really appreciate all of your wisdom and time tonight on the line. Thank you for listening to this episode of Citizens Climate Lobby's training program. You can tune into more episodes anywhere podcasts are available. Inspired by what you heard today? Join Citizens Climate Lobby to advocate for bipartisan climate solutions. Go to community.citizensclimate.org to find more trainings, resources, your local chapter, national action teams, discussion forums, and more. Be sure to like our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Citizens Climate. We also invite all of our listeners to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more inspiration. And together, we are creating the political will for a livable world.